Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now then, Michael Gove's dramatic entry into the Tory leadership race has made this contest already more bitter and bloody than any I can remember. With one blow, he took out the man assumed to be the front runner, but he now faces some formidable opponents and accusations of betrayal. And he joins me now. Welcome. That is the problem you face now, isn't it, Michael Gove? That, you know, many of your own party, many of the <coughs> newspapers, many people see you as somebody who has betrayed your close friend Boris Johnson, having betrayed your close friend. David Cameron, and for that reason, you are not going to win this leadership contest. Uh, I'm in this leadership contest because I want to advance certain arguments and certain principles. I believe that we need to have, as the next Prime Minister, someone who believes that Britain should be outside the European Union and who argued for it. Now, I've taken some difficult decisions, but I've always taken those because I put my country and my principles first. If I'd really wanted to be leader out of personal ambition, yes. I could have announced my leadership bid last weekend. There were a number of people who were asking me then to put my name forward. This is but I deliberately, deliberately did not do that because I wanted to put the national interest before my personal well, interest. Or because you deliberately wanted to destroy Boris Johnson's career. I mean, you did not have to do it in the way you did it. Um, if, if I had been like you and I had had a difference with a friend, I would have driven across the road across London to my friend and I'd have said there's something we need to discuss. You didn't do that. You left him in the dark until l the very last moment humiliating him publicly and destroying him publicly. I uh, came to the conclusion reluctantly after throwing my heart and soul for uh, four or five days into trying to get Boris to become the leader of the Conservative Party that he could not do that job and I so right the until the essence of the problem right until the 11th hour I was talking to parliamentary colleagues and friends, seeking to persuade them that Boris could lead this country and could be Prime Minister. But in the final 24 hours, there were actions that were taken, decisions that were ducked, Sorry, that led me to which, believe... Which actions and which decisions? Because this really matters. It's been laid out in, in some clarity in the newspapers. Boris had the opportunity to build a team. Boris had the opportunity to lay out a particular vision in the last 24 hours, and I felt that he did not step up to that challenge. And there was a deadline. In different circumstances, we could have had a conversation, but the deadline was noon the next day. And I faced a basic choice. Could I recommend to, recommend to the country and to my colleagues that Boris was the right person to lead us as Prime Minister? I could not in all conscience do that. I knew that by taking that decision, all sorts of people would attack me personally. But I love my country. I could not recommend that Boris was Prime Minister. I had tried to make that work. And therefore, it would have been a genuine betrayal of principle and of this country to have allowed so, Boris's so in, candidacy in, to go in, ahead with my support. So instead, you betrayed him by not going to see him and telling him what you were doing and letting him go out just hours before he was going to announce his leadership thing. And it all felt that it, was an it wasn't just a decision by you. It was an operation by then. The, pre the press were squared. Middle class weren't prepared. But there was an operation going on at that point. No, I took that decision. Lots of people moved to your camp very, very quickly. Phone calls were made to journalists very, very quickly. Uh, at a point where Boris Johnson himself didn't know what was going on. I took the decision. Um, very late um, on Wednesday evening. Mm -hmm. um, I went to bed at 1.30 in the morning. I reflected on it. I woke up early in the morning and decided... You that, could have um, called him at 7 a.m. and told I him. decided that I could not, in conscience, make that recommendation. I talked to um, my closest colleagues um, and, then, and my wife. And then I made that decision and I sought to ring Boris that morning. I, I spoke to uh, one of his... Um, uh, colleagues and lieutenants and I explained my decision. But the clock was ticking and the decision had to be made before noon. Now the question that I faced was a basic one. Of course people were going to criticise me for yes. not following through. But ultimately, throughout my political life I've asked myself one question. What is right for this country? And if there is a personal cost to me I will well, bear it. You're running for Prime Minister. There isn't a personal cost. I mean, you, you've got what you wanted. Well, and your party are saying this is exactly like Ed Miliband stabbing David Miliband in the back. There'll be people who will say all sorts of things, but um, there's been, as you can see in the newspapers, personal criticism directed against me. There's one other thing. I withdrew my support for Boris. Boris could have chosen to go on if he wished to. The fact that he didn't, I think, is telling. And one of the things that I would say is that my judgment 
about what is right for this country will always guide me. And on that basis, I came, as I say, reluctantly and with a heavy heart, because I enjoyed working with Boris during the referendum campaign. I think he has great talents and great abilities. But you need something else to be Prime Minister. You need to have that grip, that executive authority, that sense of purpose, that clarity. I had hoped that Boris would show that, but in the end it wasn't there. But you don't have it either. You're not capable of being Prime Minister. Well, you said so yourself, as you know. The one thing I can tell you is that there are lots of talented people who could be Prime Minister after David Cameron, but um, uh, count me out. You'd rather be Prime Minister yourself. Uh, no. Uh, the, the one thing I absolutely don't want to do is to be Prime Minister. I could not be Prime Minister. I'm not equipped to be Prime Minister. I don't want to be Prime Minister. If anyone wants to get me to, to sign a piece of parchment in my own blood saying that I don't want to be Prime Minister, if that's what it takes, uh, then I'm perfectly happy to do that. I don't want to be Prime Minister. Um, I, I absolutely... I think we've got um, in David Cameron a brilliant Prime Minister. Having seen close up how he does the job, I know that I couldn't do it. Um, during the course of the last six months, I've had to make some difficult decisions. I didn't want to be in this position. And if I'd wanted to be leader, if my sole ambition was place and position, if I just wanted the glory in the job, then I would have declared my candidacy last week when so many friends were urging me to do so. But I put my own personal ambition uh, to oh, one side and on. did what I thought was right for the country. And now I'm entering this race because I think the next leader of the country needs to be someone who believes heart and soul that Britain should be outside the European Union, who also has the executive experience of driving through reform, and also, as well as that executive experience, will be someone who everyone recognises is acting not from any personal motive well, of aggrandizement, hold on, hold on. but is acting from principle. You brought down David Cameron, then you brought down Boris Johnson. Some people are saying that you are a kind of political serial killer. Um, I didn't make the decision to call the referendum. That was David Cameron's decision. He chose the timing and he chose the basis. I thought hard, because you're right, I have enormous respect for him. But if you put, friendships, on him, you know. if you put friendship and personal relations before what is right when you were a politician, you're not serving your country. You have to serve your country by doing what is right. I believe that Britain would be better off outside the European Union, and a majority of people in this country voted for that course. So mm. ultimately, what matters is not the state of personal relations in Westminster. What matters is that the country has leadership from someone who argued and believed that we should leave the European Union, who's not interested in personal games, but interested well, in political interested in personal principle. games. What happened last week was a kind of personal game to end all personal games. It was the political assassination of Boris Johnson's career on live television in the most humiliating circumstances, where you said really humiliating things about him to the British people and destroyed him in front of all of us. If there is any definition of a bit of brutal kind of political knife work, that was it, surely. I made it clear that I did not believe that Boris should be Prime Minister after having worked incredibly hard You've over the preceding four or five days. How long have you known Boris Johnson for? I've how long him, has he been a friend for? I've known him for many years, but... 30 years? Uh, but uh, when, during the referendum campaign, he campaigned with such passion and brio, I believed that he might become the person who could be our Prime Minister. And but you were close during to those... him all that time, and you didn't think before that he wouldn't make it? During that period, he was... Um, supported by the, uh, uh, the architecture of the Leave campaign, and he did, a, he did a very, very good job. But critically, I wanted him to be Prime Minister, and I realised during those four days that um, he was not the man and this was not the time. You're a big Game of Thrones fan, I think, is that right? Um, I enjoy all sorts of television programmes, yes, including not, your not, own. We're not going to, thank you very much, indeed. Um, House of Cards. Uh, yes, I saw the British version. I haven't seen the American version. You are, you are our Frank Underwood, a lot of people are saying this morning. Well, as I mentioned earlier... If there you are... turn to that camera and say something sinister, it'll be perfect. Uh, well, uh, as I said earlier, um, there are all sorts of people who will say disobliging things about me. I don't mind that, because I would rather that people said, this is a man who sticks to his principles, rather than this is a man who is worried about popularity and worried about um, uh, words that are uttered right. in newspapers or in television programmes. Or indeed in television programmes. Now, another close friend of yours for the time being is George Osborne. You spent the last weekend with him. I think you're going on holiday with him and so forth. He remains close. You spoke to him all the way through the campaign. Let me read you again what he said this week. Mm. I think we are in a prolonged period of economic adjustment for the UK. We are adjusting to life outside the EU and it will not be as economically rosy as life inside the EU. It is very clear that the country is going to be poorer as a result of what's happening to the economy. 
and then he talked about spending cuts and fiscal Yes. and so forth. Do you agree with him? Let me put you right on one thing first. I don't actually agree with him on that, which is that I didn't spend last weekend with George Osborne. I spent last weekend trying to make sure that Boris Johnson could become leader of the Conservative Party and throwing myself heart and soul into it. Absolutely unsuccessfully. Boris mm. took the decision to withdraw. On the question of the economy, I outlined on Friday a plan for how we could take advantage of this new departure. The British people voted for change, not for business as usual. They want to ensure that we grasp the opportunities that leaving the European Union yeah. can give us. New opportunities to trade with countries like uh, Australia and New Zealand that have already been on the telephone demanding to get new arrangements here. But also there's much more that we need to do to change the economy. Because the referendum revealed that even though our economy has been growing, not everyone has been benefiting from that economic Absolutely. growth. There are two Britons. There is a Britain that's done very well nicely out of uh, our current economic arrangements, but a Britain that has been left behind. And my candidacy is specifically designed to focus attention on working people on average and below average incomes who have been let down consistently in the past right. and who voted in such numbers and it, for and a change. And it's a, it's, a, it's a radical change of direction, as you said yourself. Yes. It includes things like an attack on people at the top who have earned money you don't feel they have really deserved in, yes. in finances and so forth. And you have said again this morning, what you can't stand is politicians making airy promises that never become legislation. Quite. So what is the legislation? How are you going to crack down on people earning too much? Are you going to introduce a super tax or what are you going to do? I think there are things that we can do to change the way in okay. which companies specifically um, pay individuals for tasks that... Um, uh, uh, they perform badly. We have a problem. So I'm looking for a specific policy proposal here. I'm explaining that specific policy proposal. Mm. Mm. We have a problem at the moment whereby individuals, um, when they uh, run companies which they've never created, they're hired managers, mm. um, pay themselves as though they were Steve Jobs, when in fact they behave like David Brent. And then at the end of it, when they've failed, they get massive payoffs and gilt-edged pensions. I'm going to look at the laws mm. that govern how corporate pay is fixed and how corporate payoffs are delivered in order to ensure that we do not have a culture of payment for failure. I outlined before the general election that okay. the Conservative Party needed to be warriors for the dispossessed. I explained after the general election that we needed to tackle the scandal of the undeserving rich. Politicians on the right and have you, been complacent. And you are going to get those, those numbers down. You're going to tax or otherwise remove bonuses and people from people at the top of the hill, are you? I'm not going to use... Um, uh, uh, I'm if use... it's not just words, you have to have a oh, concrete of course. proposal. Of course. Well, I launched my leadership bid on Friday and I explained in some detail then some of the specific problems that we have in uh, income inequality in our society. I'm the uh, candidate for the leadership okay. of this country who has spoken most about the scandal of inequality and who in office delivered plans in order to ensure okay. that the poorest children and victims of the criminal justice system were at last supported in a way they right. hadn't been okay. before. We, before. We, we've done that, I think. If we go with you as a country, we're going to be taking a gamble and we're going to be taking a gamble on your judgment. And I put it to you, your past judgment has not always been 2020 perfect. Here is you on the Northern Ireland peace process. Mm. The Belfast Agreement has at its heart, however, an even greater wickedness. It's a capitulation to violence, a validation of terrorism. The moral stain of such a process will prove hard to efface. It is a humiliation of our army, police and parliament. But worse still, it is a denial of our national integrity. I put it to you that there are lots of people walking around today who, if that peace agreement had not been concluded, would be dead or maimed. And that that was a horrendous or error of judgment on your part? Um, I certainly am glad that we now have peace in Northern Ireland. But of course, looking back at the process of negotiation, I think it could have been handled in a different you way. You said wickedness, you said moral stain, you said this was absolutely wrong, and you were absolutely wrong, were you not? Uh, there was a problem with the Northern Ireland peace process, but one of the things I would say now is that um, uh, we now have peace in Northern Ireland. I'm delighted that we do, but there are things that we did during the negotiations um, in the way in which we handled the IRA that I would not have done. And there are people, naturally, who felt, um, as I did, discomfort, I'll put it no more highly, well, at the thought that people who have been involved... It's a wickedness and moral stain there to is, discomfort. There is, a, there is certainly a moral question about whether or not someone who'd been engaged in terrorism should be in office, and I found that and uh, very okay. difficult and to take. And one of the reasons, and similarly, so one of I the reasons, um, since you've asked me, it's, yeah. it's a serious matter. One of the reasons is that I have clear principles, and one of my principles is that I believe in the integrity of our United Kingdom, 
I don't like the idea that uh, uh, we should be um, uh, allowing our country to be influenced by a terrorist campaign. And I believe that in standing up for the unity of our kingdom and standing up against um, uh, violence and intimidation, I'm standing up for values which the majority of people in this would country you use, share. Would you therefore use the British Parliament to forbid Nicola Sturgeon from holding a second independence referendum in Scotland? I don't believe that we'll need to go down that path. I believe, as I've explained to you before right. here, okay. that uh, there's no appetite for a second referendum in Scotland. Okay. And the other thing that um, it seems to many people a bit of a policy misjudgment, you were a great, great supporter of the Iraq war, and you said even after it was all over, this was going to go down as one of the great British policy successes of modern times. After so many dead, do you still believe that? We're going to have the Chilcot inquiry. ISIS, ISIS out? Well, we're going to have the, the Chilcot inquiry mm -hmm. in two days or three days' time. Uh, there'll be an opportunity then to learn the lessons. But one of the things I think is right is that, um, of course, we need to be more modest when we're intervening abroad. Absolutely. But we also need to be resolute in the face of terror. And as the uh, only leadership but, candidate but, but, who's laid out a specific manifesto on how we deal with terrorism and how we, we deal with extremism, I believe that I've got the which experience you must have had in your and the back, insight. In your inside pocket before this all happened. You must have been preparing this before it happened. No. I, I've written... Okay. I've, I've written... Fi fi final, qu final question. For I asked Andrea Ledson this, so I have to ask you this, the same question. Um, David Cameron has published his tax returns. Will you, before nominations close, publish your tax returns? Of course, yes. Marvellous. Michael Gove, thank you for that very crisp answer.